Hey guys, and welcome to chapter two in AP U.S. Gov. Uh, we're looking at the Constitution today. Before we can talk about the Constitution, we want to look at the influences of the Constitution and why the Constitution exists. Okay, so the well, first thing we want to look at is Declaration of Independence, and we're going to talk mostly about the Declaration in class. Okay, but um, let's first off just kind of review a little bit about the Declaration. The Declaration itself. Um, was a proclamation to to England to the United Kingdom that says hey We don't like what you're doing. We're gonna do our own thing. Don't try and stop us Okay, that's what it was. We it was a list of things that says hey, here's why we don't like what you're doing We're gonna do our own thing and so that's what the declaration really is and it's kind of the birthplace for us um, as a country Okay, uh, it is influenced by several people and the first and the biggest one is definitely John Locke And we're gonna see his influence on the Constitution as well Okay, and so first we want to look at John Locke and what we call natural law what he called natural law Okay, so John Locke said that people were born free and equal and we see that in the Declaration of Independence with all men are created equal um, wh Whether we really think all men uh, it, 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 that's certainly up for debate, but um, John Locke believed in natural rights that people were born free and equal. And he said that no one, no one subject to another without own consent. That no one is subject to somebody else. That nobody has to belong to somebody else. Nobody has to follow somebody else's rules without um, your, your consent. So I don't have to follow your rules without you deciding, yes, this is what's going to happen. And you don't have to follow mine. Now, that does not mean that there's, there's not consequences in the world, but you allow yourself to be ruled by somebody else is what John Locke said. Um, he also says that people have not only the, the right or the, um, the ability to, to, to rise up if they don't like the way that they're governed, that the responsibility to do so. And this is where the Declaration really comes into play here, because the Declaration, we rise up against England, and because we did not like, we, we thought that we were being oppressed by England, we had not only the right, but the obligation to do so. Um, and this is what the Declaration, the kind of the backbone of the Declaration is going to be. So we're going to see John Locke all over the Declaration, but we want to look at a couple specifics here. So first, we want to see um, in his natural laws, he said that all men were entitled to uh, three uh, natural rights according to um, to just kind of being here in, in existence, uh, that they are divinely given uh, from God or from whatever um, divinity that he that people believed at, at, that, at that time. Uh, and so he said that everybody has the right to life, to liberty, and to property, and that the responsibility of government was to protect life and liberty and property. Okay, um, and we, we, we hear that life, liberty, property, um, and we, we have something very similar to that in the Declaration with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, and and the, the, the story goes that um, Ben Franklin decided, well, we, we may want to tax property at some point, so we don't want to give it to people as a right, uh, as life, liberty, property. And so um, we, we, we want to change that. And so it, it, after, after debate, it becomes the pursuit of happiness okay so this is one of the, the one of the more strong backbones of the United States in the Declaration um, and this comes from John Lott uh, I, I like to say in class that if um, if turnitin.com existed at the time of the Declaration uh, there would have been red marks all over the Declaration of Independence okay because a lot of this comes from our our, uh, our enlightenment thinkers as is a, a lot of the backbone of our government uh, moving forward and we're going to take a look at that right now so part of that is going to become with uh, John Jacques Rousseau uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, which is fun to say, if you haven't said it yet today, you, you really should. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, he, he comes up with uh, an idea kind of kind of mixed in with these Enlightenment thinkers of the social contract. And, and we, we, see, we see Hobbes, we see, um, we see Locke talk about the social contract. Many, many people are talking about the social contract. Uh, and he, and Rousseau, also does. The social contract is uh, we are going to give up some of our rights as, as citizens, uh, as just people, uh, some of those freedoms in order to have that protection from the government. So, so I will maybe give up the right to, to steal or to lie or to cheat or to, to murder even uh, and protection for, for, from the government to, to keep people from doing those kind of things 
uh, to me. Um, John Jacques Rousseau has, has a, uh, a very famous quote that said that man were born free um, and, and then everywhere we look in the world, they're in chains. And so it's not, um, it's not natural for us not to be free and that we should be uh, as free as we choose to be. Um, the social contract is kind of this agreement um, that the, these natural rights, that we're going to exchange some of those um, for security. And that's what we're going to get from John Jacques Rousseau. In addition with Rousseau, we're going to get the idea of popular sovereignty. Uh, and, and I'm sure that you've heard this phrase already because we it, this is part of, of our government. But you may not know what popular sovereignty means. It means that people are ultimately the ruling authority, uh, that we decide who um, is going to govern us and how we are going to be governed. Now, this is the case around the world. If we look to other countries, we are going to see popular sovereignty. Okay, uh, If we look back to... Um, Goodness to to Russia in World War One, uh, which were, were, they're rule, they're under this dictatorship, and the people do rise up in the Russian Revolution, right? Uh, the the people decided we don't like this, we're changing it, okay? And that is popular sovereignty. The people ultimately have the final say, and that's John Jacques Rousseau. So as we move forward with the um, and the Enlightenment thinkers, we've got Locke, we've got Hobbes, and we've got Rousseau. We don't want to leave out uh, Montesquieu. Montesquieu is going to be somebody who is going to give us kind of um, another one of those we, we we keep seeing the backbone. If we we think of um, a person's backbone with the the, the different pieces of the the vertebrae, um, th those are th each of those are going to make up kind of our our country and our. Um, foundation and uh, one of those is the separation of powers which is given to us through through Montesquieu's writings and his his um, discussions uh, and so we see that in the the US Constitution with the executive branch the legislative branch and the judicial branch that we we're gonna separate that power um, he thought that the the um, power was too much too big of a responsibility to give to one person or to one group and so it needed to be spread out amongst uh, many groups and so we have an executive branch and a judicial branch and of course the, our, um, our, our legislative branch who is going to make the laws. So um, after the Declaration of Independence, we, we move forward into, into the, uh, the Revolutionary War, and uh, eventually the 13 colonies become the 13 states. And this is, this is going to occur uh, in a confederation. We're going to talk about the, uh, a confederation later in the course, but um, we're going to talk about a federal system or a con confederate system or a unitary system. But the confederation basically means that the states are going to have more power than the central government. And, of course, we know that the, the king was, uh, was very... Um, very oppressive to the, to the colonies, and this is a big reason that they, we wanted a, um, a confederation, that the states were going to have more power than the central government, so we didn't re just kind of repeat what we just went through with the Revolutionary War. Uh, and so this brings us to the Articles of Confederation, which is basically our first constitution. And when we talk about constitutions, we want to think about them being kind of a rule book for us, um, uh, kind of our guidelines for how we're going to run our country, okay? And so the Articles of Confederation get a bad rap. They, they did a lot of things that if we look at them closely, we can see um, that they did do some, some things that were, that were very good, okay? And so the first thing is um, Congress, uh, remember that in the, in the Articles there's no, general, no judicial branch, no executive branch, so Congress is the, basically our central government uh, exclusively. Uh, and so Congress could engage in international diplomacy. So we could engage in talks with other countries, okay? Um, and so they would do, do so on behalf of the 13 states, and so that each state didn't have to have its own treaties uh, of, um, of peace with, with other countries. Uh, Congress could also declare war, the opposite of, of diplomacy. So Congress could um, say, hey, we're going to be going to war with France or with England or, or, or with, with whomever. Uh, Congress could acquire territory. Uh, remember, we've, the 13 colonies are just a small part of what becomes the United States. And so this is, this is a big deal. Um, the, if the articles also provided for the protection of religion and speech, which we're going to see in the Bill of Rights later on in the, uh, um, the existing Constitution. Um, it provided for extradition. Extradition is going to be uh, if you commit a crime in one state or one country and then move to another country or state, you're not automatically protected. Uh, you can be extradited back to that country or to that state. So, for example, if you commit a crime in Illinois and then move to Texas, 
uh, Texas may may find you and then ship you back to Illinois where you would be tried. Uh, and so um, that would be extradition. And so this is a big deal. Instead of just being able to flee from Massachusetts to New York and get away with murder or get away with it, now we had a, a process to bring you back to uh, that original state so that you could answer to your crime for your crimes. Um, you are, it encouraged, the articles also encouraged a free flow of commerce uh, between the states. Um, up until the articles, um, each state was kind of in competition with itself or with it, with each other. Um, and so this is, it, it gives the, um, the states the ability to kind of trade as a collective group, um, kind of, um, almost like a free trade agreement between, between the, the states. Uh, and then it required states to provide a fair public government, um, where Congress could sit as a, um, as a court if, for disputes between states. Uh, and so it could, um, we could have um, Congress kind of act as, um, our, as our judicial system if states had disputes against each other. So a lot of good things come out of the Articles of Confederation. And we can stop and think, why did they do these things? And we can directly link them to what happened uh, very recently to them and why they separated from, uh, from England um, just a, a few years earlier. Okay. As I said, the articles do get kind of a bad rap, and there is, there is some very um, deserving reasons for it. There are some glaring weaknesses in the Articles and Confederations. First off, in order to uh, enact a law, nine states had to agree. It was not just 50%. It was more than 50%. Nine of the 13 had to agree for the law. Um, and in order to amend the Articles of Confederation, all 13 had to amend it. So if we are looking at something that was going to benefit a small state or a large state, the opposite is not going to vote for it, and it's going to be 12 to 1, not amended, okay? And so the Articles of Confederation was incredibly difficult to, to amend. Uh, there was no direct taxation of the people, um, and because of that, the, the government is a, unable to pay for anything that it needs to do. If it needs to declare war, if it needs to um, do anything, um, anything, it, it, can't, it can't afford to do so because it has no money to do so. Um, it had no provisions for raising or maintaining an army. Sure, we could declare war, but what, who are we going to declare war with? Okay. Had no national court system. Like I said earlier, the Congress kind of acted as the judicial system when there were disputes between states. But we need some kind of national law um, um, interpretation. And then oh, there's no national currency, so we've got Massachusetts money and New York money. And we remember they're, they're free to trade with each other. And now what's... what's, what's um, there's no like stock exchange where um, this month the money's worth this much here, money worth this much here. We don't have the internet to find those things out. And so how do you how do you really truly um, trade between the states? Um, and then Congress cannot uh, regulate commerce among the states. It was there to kind of act as a uh, as that jury or as that judge at the end when there were disputes, but. Um, Remember, this is not um, this is not today's age where we can just go right straight to to the Capitol and figure these things out. This is very time intensive, and so the article has become very very weak. And we're going to see this weakness uh, glare the biggest in Shays' Rebellion. Shays' Rebellion happened in 1786 in Massachusetts. Uh, we have a bunch of farmers who are veterans of the Revolutionary War, and they were not paid for their service, okay? Uh, and they're starting to lose farms due to foreclosures and having to pay very high taxes, okay? And so these farmers are very upset, and they said that, the, you know, the, the, we were never paid for our efforts to this country, and now we're having our farms taken away on top of it. Um, and so Shays, who is one of, one of the, the farmers, asked the government to print more money. Uh, and to lighten the taxes and to suspend the mar mortgages for these farmers so that they can make a living um, because of their service to, to, to the country. Uh, the, this armed rebellion occurs and there's no federal army to stop it. And so basically you have this bunch of farmers almost take down uh, the United States. And so what happens is the leaders then re realize uh, we need some kind of... Um, some changes so that we have a stronger federal government so that just anybody can't rise up and take over the country at any time. And so they're going to meet in Maryland, and they agree to get, meet again in May of 1787. This is going to be our Constitutional Convention, that they did not know that at the time. This is super important, guys. The Constitution, as it is written today, we, we did not show up and say, okay, we're going to make a new Constitution now. That's not what happened. They originally were showing up to just try and make changes to the Articles of Confederation. And um, the great realization is 
we just can't fix it. We've got to start from scratch. There's too many weaknesses. We just listed all those weaknesses. Um, there's just no, there's nothing that we can do with this document. We need to start from scratch and make a new document, the new constitution that is, that we established and we, that we have today. Okay, so uh, when we're designing this new constitution, everybody's got their own ideas, okay? And everybody's got their own agenda. And so we have to figure out how are we gonna mesh all this together in one document and have it, have it work for everybody. And so um, we have several uh, different compromises that we're gonna need to know. And the first one is the great compromise. And in order to understand the great compromise, we have to take a step backwards. And we have to look at the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan. So the Virginia plan is by Edmund Rudolph, who was the Virginia governor. And he presented a plan that said that um, we need a two-house legislature, okay, bicameral legislature, somewhat similar to what we have today with House and Senate. Um, but we need a, two, a bicameral legislature. The lower house is going to be elected by the people, and the upper house will be elected by that lower house, okay? And then they are going to be the ones who pass the laws. Um, it provided the Virginia plan provided for a supreme national government. They were in charge. They were the ones who were above all of the states, and it provided for a separation of powers between an executive branch, a judicial branch, and a legislative branch. Okay, so similar to what we have here. So we're take we're going to take some of those parts and and use it further on uh, down the road. Um, it had a tiered court system, and it had it becomes known as the large state plan. And it's not because the plan is big, but it's because Virginia is big, the large state plan. And here's the problem, and here's the big sticking point for a lot of states. Virginia was a very big state, and so they said that we should decide how big the House of Representatives is and how many representatives each state gets based on population. Therefore, a big state like Virginia would get a lot of people in the House of Representatives or in the lower house, and then uh, a small, a smaller state like Rhode Island or like New Jersey would get very few representatives in the in this lower house, and therefore the the Virginia would be be able to get uh, several more. Um, it's a lot more influence in, in, in that house. And so you can see right away where the problem is going to be for some of these smaller states. And so they don't agree right away. And this becomes known as the large state plan, the Virginia plan. If we've got a large state plan, you know we have to have a small state plan, right? It just makes sense. And so the New Jersey plan introduced by William Patterson from New Jersey becomes known as the small state plan. Um, in the New Jersey plan, states retain their sovereignty. Their sovereignty, they are, they are the ones who are going to make decisions for themselves. So the national government is not supreme. Uh, so this is going to be something that we take from the Virginia plan, okay? Uh, now, of course, in, in our federalist system, the states do have some power, but the national government is supreme. That's, that's going to be in the supremacy clause in the Constitution, which we'll talk about later. Uh, the national legislature is limited and defined. And so it says here is exactly what they can do. And that we're going to see again in, uh, in a couple minutes um, that the um, Constitution says here's exactly what the national government can do. And if it doesn't say that, then the states get to decide that. That's going to be our 10th Amendment. Super important, but we're going to talk about that later. Um, the New Jersey plan also had no national courts. Um, and it be, like I said, it becomes known as a small state plan because of the way that they decide on representation. Um, they look at representation and they say, let's do it by equality. Every state gets this many representatives. Okay. Um, and so the collection of sovereign states gathered together to govern. And so it was, it believed much more in state rights and, um, Virginia believed much more in, um, the rights of the individuals. Uh, and so this is going to be kind of debated. And again, it's going to be come together in the great compromise. So the great compromise becomes, uh, let's combine the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan. The Virginia plan becomes our House of Representatives, okay? And we're going to select them based on representation. So if we go around the country, Illinois has um, this many representatives, where California has uh, 55, I believe, representatives. Um, and then we go to, like, Montana, where they have one representative, okay? And so we go around, and it's based on how big the population is in each state, and that's how many representatives we're going to get. The Senate, then, become, comes from the small state plan, the New Jersey plan. Every state, Illinois, New Jersey, um, Montana, Colorado, California, each one gets two senators, regardless of the size of the state. 
Okay, they're all going to get two. And so this becomes the small state comes from the small state plan. Um, the Virginia plan becomes the House of Representatives. This, the uh, New Jersey plan becomes our Senate. And so this is the Great Compromise. It's also known as the Connecticut Compromise. Okay, and so this is um, super important because this is the first kind of here's here's our decision. Here's our compromise. Here's how we're going to dissolve this problem. Our next compromise is what do we do for representation? We, we talk about the, uh, the House of Representatives is going to be based on how many people are in that state. And so for some places like Massachusetts, um, um, New Hampshire, uh, New York, th this is not an issue, okay? We count how many people there are, we say, here's how many people, here's how many representatives you get. But in some states, South Carolina maybe, where there are slaves, now there becomes a problem because South Carolina says, wait, 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 we've got a lot of people here. And, and places like uh, New York are going to look at that state and say, no, you don't. You have very few people. Uh, and the, the, the South Carolina is going to say, but look at all these people. And New York says, you don't call those people, you call that property. And South Carolina says, well, they count here, they're still people. And they said, well, let, go ahead and free them then. If they're, if they're people, they're free to go. They said, no, 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 they're not people, they're slaves. And they said, but then, then if they're slaves, then they don't count as people. And they said, oh, certainly they do. They're people, they need to be represented. And so there's this conflict and the kind of this uh, roundabout um, decision making. And so what we wind up with is the three-fifths compromise. The three-fifths compromise is by uh, Roger Sherman and James Wilson introduced this. And they said that every slave counts as three-fifths of a person uh, for purposes of representation in the House of Representatives. Now, um, please, please, please understand this because this is something that gets um, misinterpreted often. Um, this is not a win or a lose for, uh, for African Americans in our country. Um, this, they are still slaves, okay? Uh, they are not free. They are no longer, th they don't have three-fifths of a vote, okay? Um, but they also didn't lose any rights because they had no rights to begin with, okay? This is, the, for, for African Americans, they, this is not impacting them at all. They don't know what's happening, okay? Um, and so for, for the three-fifths compromise, um, please don't think that all of a sudden they've get, they're getting some rights here. They're becoming three-fifths of a person where they were just, they used to be slaves. They're still slaves. The only thing that's happening is now South Carolina is getting some more representation in the House of Representatives because the slaves exist there. Um, that's, the, that's all it is. Um, the Three-Fifths Compromise, pretty racist part of our Constitution that's, that fortunately has been to, um, um, amended out of, of the Constitution. Okay, our next big compromise is how do we elect our president? Okay, um, some people thought that we'll let Congress do it. Um, and some, some other people said, let's let the states do it. We'll let the state legislatures do so. Um, some other ones said each state gets one vote. Um, and then some people said, let's have the popular, let the, let the, the population decide. And um, there was a lot of argument, a lot of uh, people saying that, no, your way is wrong, this way is better. This way is wrong, this way is better. And so what we come up with is the Electoral College. Okay, and there's a lot of uh, debate about the Electoral College today, and we maybe get into some of that in a later chapter, but for right now, we just want to know that the Electoral College is kind of that compromise of all these different plans. And so what's going to happen is states are going to decide on um, electors, and that's going to be how many people, how many representatives in Congress they have, so how many reps and senators, and that's going to count as how many electors they are going to receive. So for example, if you had one representative and two senators, you're going to get three electoral votes. We'll count those up in Washington, D.C. after the elections and decide here is who is going to be the president. Okay, So people are going to vote for electors, not for the actual president. Uh, this is an elite model of government and it still exists today. And we're going to talk about why it still exists today, like I said, in another chapter down the road. But for right now, what we need to know about the Electoral College is simply that it is in a, a compromise and it belongs in those compromises with the Great Compromise and with um, the Three-Fifths Compromise as we're molding our Constitution, our rule book for, um, for the country. So let's talk about a little bit about how the Constitution is set up. First, we've got the preamble. And the preamble is there to tell us, here is what we intend for this Constitution to do. It's kind of saying, um, this Constitution was developed so that we can do this. Um, and so it's, um, we the people of the United States, in order to, to form a more perfect union, est to establish justice, to promote the general welfare, um, 
all of these different things in the preamble, that's what is there. It's kind of like a, um, an introductory paragraph to say, here's what we intend to do. Uh, okay, uh, here's our intention for writing this constitution. And that's what the preamble is there for. After the preamble, we have seven articles. And the first three articles set up our separation of powers. Okay, we have the legislative branch who is going to make the laws, the executive branch who is going to execute the laws, and the judiciary branch who is going to interpret the laws. And it lays out the powers of each of those three and how are they how they are going to be set up. For example, that the uh, House of Representatives will be elected directly, that the executive branch will be elected through the Electoral College, that the judicial branch will be appointed by the president. Okay, uh, And so it lays out kind of the groundwork for those and it separates those powers and sets up the checks and balances, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, Article 4 is the relations among states. Article 5 is the amendment process, uh, which we're going to talk about in a minute as well. And then Article 6 is the national supremacy. So we the supremacy clause, the, the United States Constitution is the law of the land above the states even. And then Article 7 tells, here's the ratification process. Here's how we're going to say each state has signed on to this and they have become part of the United States. So the seven articles of the Constitution. Okay, so as we go through this course, we're going to be talking about different powers. We're going to be talking about implied powers or enumerated powers. Enumerated powers is where we want to start. These are the powers that are specifically granted through the Constitution. And the first place and the most important place that we want to look today is Article 1, Section 8. Article 1, Legislative Branch, Section 8, lists the powers of Congress. Okay, now, if we look at the Constitution, it looks very much like um, a, a paper that I might get from my econ kids, okay? Uh, many of you may have had to write the hoot paper, the infamous hoot paper. Uh, and what I get is that first section is just awesome. And it's lots of meat, lots of research. And the second section, a little bit of meat. We're doing okay, but it's not nearly as good as that first section. And then the third section is, it's 10.30 at night before it's due. I got to finish this. Here you go. It's done. Okay? It's very quick. It's very, very raw. When we look at the Constitution, it's similar to that. The Article One has got lots and lots to it, okay? There's all these powers that are listed. Article Two, uh, here's a couple things that the President can do, and Article Three almost basically says, here's have a, have a court, and if you want more of them, make more of them, okay? And obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm hyperbolizing a little bit, but uh, if we look at Article One, there's so much there. But if we stop and look at why, Remember, we just came out of this war with a huge king who was very, very overbearing on the, the states. And so we, we did fear that strong central government. And so we gave a lot of power to the Congress, which is closer to the people. And the further we get from the people, the less, we, the less enumerated, the less powers we wrote down said, here's what you get to do. Um, and so that there is, there is an intentionality to that big long list in, in Congress and then it smalls up and smalls up and smalls up as, as we move through Article 1, Article 2, Article 3. But if we look at Article 1, Section 8, uh, um, the, the enumerated powers, enumerated means we're going to enumerate them, we're saying them, we're writing them down. This is what you can do. Okay. When we look at those, we see that Congress has the ability to tax. We talked about in the articles, they did not have that, that ability. This is a huge change. They have the ability to run a credit, so borrow money. They have the ability to raise an army, to raise a navy. Navy. They have the ability to create a postal system, uh, to address piracy, okay, uh, to define the immigration and naturalization process. Uh, pretty big today, right? Um, there's there's several other powers, uh, but the one of the biggest ones is the last one, and it almost looks like an afterthought the first time that you read through the Constitution, but it will be kind of a, a big, huge battle throughout the rest of, of our um, history up to today. And that is going to be uh, the elastic clause that says that Congress has the ability to do anything necessary and proper to fulfill all the rest of those uh, duties. And so that means basically they can stretch the, 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 the law a little bit. They can say, oh, well, we have to do this because it's necessary and proper to do that. Okay, and so this becomes known as our implied powers. So, for example, you might look at it and say, well, they have the, the right to raise an army. That's one of their powers. And so because they can raise an army, obviously they have the, the ability to purchase a tank. Okay, it doesn't say in the Constitution that they can purchase a tank. 
but it's implied that in order to have an army, you would want a tank. And so the, the United States uh, Congress can purchase a, a tank in order to raise an army. Okay, so that's kind of the implied powers. Enumerated, it's strictly written down. Implied would be uh, it, it comes from somewhere in, in, in there. Another big one in Article 1, Section 8 is the Commerce Clause. Uh, and it says that Congress has the power to regulate commerce with other nations and among the states. Okay, now this is going to be huge because interstate commerce is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And especially now with the internet, everything is interstate commerce, right? Everybody has the ability to sell in other states. Um, and so that means Congress is going to be able to um, kind of grow their power. And we're going to look at some court cases that allow them to do so. But what we want to do, if we want to look at um, their ability to, um, to reach out, um, if we look at what Congress has done with the Civil Rights Act, uh, the Civil Rights Act in the 1960s, um, there's no... Uh, if we look at a strict uh, reading of the Constitution, they should really don't have the ability to enforce this. And they said, yes, we do, be through the Commerce Clause, because we are going to say you can't discriminate against people if you are conducting interstate commerce. We're regulating interstate commerce. Okay, and so this becomes um, part of the, the Civil Rights Act, or not no discrimination. And again, if we look at a strict reading of, of their, their powers, they don't have the ability to do that. And so they had to stretch using that elastic clause so that they could um, use the, the, the Commerce Clause in order to enforce the Civil Rights Act. So another part of the Constitution I want to draw your attention to is in Article 4, the relations among the states. Uh, we have the full faith clause and the full, full faith and credit clause, actually, and then the, the um, um, privileges and immunities clause. And these are separate things, okay, and a lot of kids often get them mixed up in my class, so I want to take a second and kind of just go through these. Full faith and credit clause require states to be open about their laws and encourage states to respect one another's laws. So basically, if I'm married... Uh, in the state of Illinois, when I move to Nevada, maybe, um, I'm still married in Nevada. I don't have to get remarried. I don't get out of the marriage uh, because I left the state. Uh, they, they're going to respect, Nevada is going to respect Illinois' marriage laws. And if I'm married here, I'm married there. If I owe money here, I owe money there, okay? Full faith and credit, they're going to respect each state's um, of laws and therefore we can't just escape to a new state and get out of our responsibilities or uh, be hindered. <coughs> Another part would be uh, a driver's license. I have driven across the country from Illinois to California or from Illinois down to Florida and I did not have to get a new uh, driver's license in each state that I, I drove through. Um, full faith and credit clause covers that, that if I'm licensed in Illinois to drive, I can go through each state and I don't have to get a new driver's license in each state that I, that I go through. Okay. Now the privileges and immunities clause, the, the biggest similarity between them is it's first it's relations among states and the, the word and is in there. Outside of that, it is very different. The privileges and immunities clause says that when I visit another state, I get all the privileges and immunities that everybody else in that state receives. So if I go to um, Nevada, uh, I can participate in sports betting maybe. Okay. If I go to Utah, where the speed limit is 80, I can go 80 miles an hour. I don't have to go 70, which it is in Illinois, okay? Um, that, that I get to enjoy the same privileges and immunities that the people of that state receive, okay? That's the privileges and immunities clause, okay? Uh, it's also uh, what we find in um, Article 4 is um, the process for extradition. We talked a little bit about that already in this, in this uh, lecture, that extradition is if I commit a crime in one state, I can and flee that state, uh, I can be sent back to that state to, to stand trial. Article 6 of the Constitution is another place where I want to draw your attention. And this is the Supremacy Clause. In the Supremacy Clause, um, we find out that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. The Constitution and the laws of the U.S., uh, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, shall be the supreme law of the land. And so basically, um, our, our pecking order goes Constitution, laws made by Congress, and then we go down to the states. And state constitutions, this laws made by the states, uh, county charters maybe, and then county ordinances, and then city charters and city ordinances uh, on down the line to all the way down to your parents and then you, okay? Uh, and so we, we, this kind of is going to um, dissolve a lot of conflicts right away because 
uh, we know this, this pecking order that the supreme law of the land is the Constitution, and it supersedes all other laws that are made Constitution, um, all other laws that are made by Congress, by um, by state legislatures, by by counties, etc. Et the the Constitution of the United States is the first place that we look to see if things can be done or cannot be done. Okay, guys, there's lots of other stuff happening in the Constitution. Uh, Article 5 is going to be about the amendment process. Uh, Article 2 is about the executive branch. Article 3 is the judicial branch. The amendments going on. Bill of Rights is the first 10 amendments, 27 amendments and all. There's lots of other stuff going on. We're going to talk about those a little bit in depth. It's not that they're not important, my friends, but we're going to talk about them uh, a little bit more as we get to them in the courts. For now, what we want to know is why the Constitution looks the way it does, and then we want to know how the Constitution set up with the, the seven articles, the preamble, the, the amendments. Um, those are the important things that we really want to get out of this lecture. Um, why do we have the Constitution? Um, the Articles of Confederation were, were weak. Why do we have the Articles of Confederation? Uh, because the Declaration of Independence, we pulled out of um, an alliance with, with, with England and we started setting up our own country. We needed a rule book. Um, so those are the kind of things that we want to, to see. We want to see the Enlightenment influence. Okay, so as you're reading chapter two, look for these different things that you're that you, you should be seeing. Uh, you should be preparing for that quit that reading quiz on Thursday, guys. I hope that you are having a great evening. Uh, I will see you uh, see you soon. Remember, my friends, that it's us versus the test. We are in this together as a class. Um, there are three classes. Everybody is in this together. I want to see threes, fours, and fives from everybody. Fours and fives especially. Okay, we've got this. Keep doing your work. Keep watching the videos. Keep reading the reading, and you're going to be A-OK -okay when we come around for the test. My friends, I hope you have a great night. We'll see you in class.